let me begin by introducing our speakers. Uh, B Bill Marks is the editor of Arts Fuse, an online magazine that covers the arts in New England. And he's also the editor of the, book, of the World Book Page about international literature for the BBC program, The World. In 2002, Bill created and edited the WBUR Online Arts, edited uh, uh, WBUR Online Arts, a cultural webzine that won an, online, uh, uh, an award for online journalism in 2004. And in 2005, Bill's weekly column on the website was a finalist for the Online Journalism Award for Online Commentary. He's written about books about, about uh, he's written about books and theater for the Boston Globe and the Boston Phoenix and a number of national publications. He currently teaches a class at Boston University on American arts criticism that follows the evolution of reviewing from the 19th century until today. My hope is that we'll uh, hear a bit from Bill about that uh, interest in, the, in essentially the continuities across uh, uh, media and across, and across cultures. I'd also like to welcome some of Bill's students who have attended this session. I'm glad to see you here. I hope this won't be the first time, the only time you appear at a communications forum event. If you're interested in signing up for our, for our uh, uh, web notifications, for our email notifications, I encourage you to do so by signing up on our website. Uh, we never use that email list for anything except announcements about the forum, so you won't be inundated with irrelevant uh, emails. Our second speaker, Doug McLennan, is the founder and editor of artsjournal.com, a leading aggregator of arts journalism on the internet. Before starting Arts Journal, Doug was arts columnist and music critic for the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. He earned his master's degree in music from the Juilliard School in New York and was named one of the 100 outstanding graduates of the Juilliard School for the school centennial in 2005. Doug has written on the arts for many publications, including work as a music critic in the early days of Salon, and has written also for Newsweek, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, and The Wall Street Journal. So both of our speakers uh, have, have a special claim on our, on our broad topic. And indeed, it is a, a very broad topic. Uh, essentially, what is happening to what we broadly call arts criticism let me start with a brief definition. We can confuse the definition or complicate it or, 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 or alter it in our discussion. But broadly, what we mean by arts criticism is discourse about art, dance, drama, prose fiction, poetry, discourse about the arts in our culture and where, the, where that discourse is located, where that discourse is migrating. That's our, broadest, our broad topic. Um, so let me begin by asking. Uh, uh, each of our speakers first to begin with a, a couple of comments about the way they feel the condition, the, the, what they feel about the sort of state or nature of what we're broadly calling arts criticism in the era before the internet. Do you want to go, you want to, you want to go first? Um, I just want to thank, you want to talk about what I thought arts criticism was like before the internet? Uh, well, I mean, it's a, that's a, a large question, but essentially, uh, you know, let's, if you take it, let's say, in America from the 19th century on, I mean, arts criticism in America played a, a pivotal role in a number of major newspapers and magazines for helping to define the culture, for helping uh, to send people to or away from various performances or to read books or, or, not to, or not to read books. So essentially, it was a form of editorial, a bad way of discourse that was found in uh, you know, some of the better newspapers and magazines. Certainly in the early 19th century, um, it was a highly corrupt practice. Uh, at that point, there were no editorial standards. Someone like Edgar Allan Poe was writing the 1830s and the 1840s. Uh, you know, essentially, when they would send out a book for review, they'd send out a $5 bill in the book, indicating, <laughs> of course, and $5 was a lot in the 1830s and the 1840s. Uh, it was in, really in the late 19th century that editorial standards began to be applied to criticism that uh, partly because newspapers and magazines wanted to go for a tonier audience. In other words, if you were writing about museums, you were writing about symphony orchestras, then the assumption was that you're going to have critics that would have the expertise, have the knowledge, and would have the ethics to cover them. And you also had like the Atlantic Monthly and Harper's and a number of other Tony magazines you know, begin about at that time to become extremely popular. So the, the rules for criticism, the definition of criticism began to be 
codified then. And I guess I would add to your definition of what, uh, what arts criticism is by saying, for me, the, the definition of arts criticism is going to be is an evaluation with reasons, meaning that even in the time of Edgar Allan Poe, Poe said a review was a, an evaluation of something. It was a judgment, but you had to evaluate it by the reasons that were provided by the critic. So in other words, a review from the 19th century until today, and now perhaps that definition is beginning to weaken a bit, the definition was a judgment which was backed up by evaluation and reasons. So um, if you want to move into the, you know, I could keep moving back in the, in the past, but I would say that essentially if you're to say what was the old fashioned idea of what a criticism was, obviously it was written, it was in a newspaper, in a magazine, it was written by someone perceived to be an expert, a judge, and it was supposed to supply some sort of reasoning behind how this judge came to their evaluation. And that began to change, I'd say, generally uh, in the 19, around the turn of the century, in the, 19, the tens and the 20s, with the oncoming of popular culture. Popular culture came about, and there were prescribed ideas of what was a great symphony orchestra, what would they play, what was, you know, what was great music, great painting. But with uh, jazz, with radio, with a lot of other more popular culture films in particular, then those, the, those sorts of ideas scrambled the idea of what criticism was supposed to be and tampered with or dealt with that essential idea of evaluation with reason. Have I, do, you, do you wish me to go on or not? And I'll move up to the present or I'll move up to the 40s, 50s, 60s, or what would you like? Let's stop for a moment. All right. Well, I, I, I think that lost in a lot of conversation about what the argument about you know, what we're losing, what we're gaining, uh, in terms of arts criticism these days, is that we, we do need to, I mean, a, a lot of us think about uh, a kind of a golden age of arts criticism, um, where the newspapers have full staffs and they have critics and, and you know, we're, we're, we're talking about this, uh, uh, this kind of evaluative uh, right. process. The reality is, in most of this country, though, uh, that most newspapers did not have that kind of, of thing up until about the 1970s. So even cities in, in, uh, of the size of Minneapolis or Seattle or Salt Lake City or a lot of the cities in the West, uh, it was very rare for them to have a full uh, critical staff. And that's, that's largely a phenomenon beginning in the late 70s, early 80s. So this shrinking down of, of uh, arts staffs uh, at newspapers is, is actually, in, in, in a way, kind of going back to what we had uh, pre-70s. I, I would sort of agree, you know, I'd agree with that. I would say that you had centralized newspapers. It's like we still have the New York Times, uh, the New Yorker magazine, perhaps on the West Coast as well. Their criticism was republished or sent to newspapers around the country. So when someone reviewed New York theater and you're in Indiana or wherever you were, Alabama, you would often read the reviews of or get knowledge of what was going on in those centers of culture through the critics who wrote for the large newspapers. They're often syndicated and sent around. That's why they didn't need to hire an art staff. Basically, if they needed to plug their art, new, their art hole, they would have uh, syndicated material from some of the larger newspapers and magazines. So people were aware of what criticism was, but by having it set from, you know, from some of the larger newspapers and magazines. And they represented an ideal of what criticism should be. And uh, often, in practice, that's not what you saw in a lot of newspapers and magazines around the country. But I'm talking about sort of like what critics at their best saw themselves as doing. Right. Wouldn't you also say, though, that one of the functions that newspapers played, uh, at least in the 20th century, was a kind of uh, uh, advice to consumers role, where uh, some reviews were barely evaluative at all, simply descriptive, uh, in which uh, I'm thinking especially of uh, discourse about film and other forms of popular culture. Uh, and I guess what I'm saying is that I, it seems to me that you're that this definition of criticism as an evaluative process describes only a portion of what the sort of popular press, in fact, would often do. With, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, just of feature stories about actors or about directors or about new projects that a, a particular theater or dance group were doing. Well, I'm talking about, we're talking about specifically arts, criti criticism of the arts, which to me, you know, I'm going to argue pretty strongly deals with that evaluative judgment. There are other forms of writing about the arts coverage, such as features, what I would call, you know, pub pieces, you know, writing about 
educational pieces. Someone's coming into town. We're going to write about this, uh, you know, or you know, whatever artistic figure is coming in. And part of what you saw happening, and Doug mentions the 70s and the 80s. Part of what happened in the 70s and 80s was an attempt to sort of meld the two discourses together. There was a time, I don't know if you remember Tina, uh, when Tina Brown was the editor of The New Yorker, she said, I don't want reviews. I want what she called feature reviews. In other words, if you reviewed Angels in America and you read the review by John Lahr, it's a review, but that includes an interview with Tony Kushner. It includes interviews with the people in the production. It was an attempt to say the review itself, the evaluative act, is not as important in and of itself what we need is that additional material, interview material, feature material, which is brought in. Which, and so what you're saying is that those, the line between the feature, the reporting, the I was there and I'm going to tell you what happened, has melded, particularly since the 70s, the 80s, has begun to meld in with what you would call the evaluative function of arts criticism. See, I, I, I would really strongly disagree with that. Um, <laughs> mostly because, um, I, I mean, I think that the whole Tina Brown idea of, of, of melding there that you refer to is, is in large course a, a, a reaction uh, to what was happening in the popular press, which, was, which became more and more um, thumbs up, thumbs down, right? It, it was a, a pure recommendation. We don't want all that other stuff. We want to be popular. We want to have that consumer reports type of thing. And if you look back at the, the last 25 years of criticism in American newspapers, um, the, the preponderance of that, the vast majority of that, is that kind of consumer reports type of, of, um, of writing. I would say, and I agree with you, but I would just turn the argument out, flip it, and simply say that the Tina Brown approach, like the consumer guide approach, essentially is still about thumbs. I mean, I did not read a single Tina Brown feature review that was a negative review, or even very mixed. I mean, if I'm going to interview Tony Kushner, I'm going to interview all the actors, and I'm going to have all what they say in, in this review, I'm certainly not going to pan Angels in America. And generally, John Lahr only, and, and, and I just want to talk about John Lahr, but other critics who did that were inevitably positive. In other words, it was thumbs. It was just all the thumb was always up. And the attempt was to provide more education and information in the thumbs up, because there was the fear of, I would say the fear of, or the reluctance to deal with the evaluative act, which would challenge the reader to have to deal with the fact that the critic is raising interesting, provocative points that are negative or are actually critical of the art that they're reviewing. That's what everyone is sort of afraid of. And that includes the thumbs up and thumbs down, because there's no evaluation there. It's only, I love it. I hate it with no evaluation either whether you why you like something up or why you like something down. Right, but I, I think the, 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 when you bring up the New Yorker, which you know uh, has maybe three, four theater pieces in a given month, there's a very small number of things that you can choose of, uh, proportionately a tiny fraction of what you could actually write about. Or if you're NPR and you have just a, a tiny window of it, they've made a decision at some level that, oh, OK, all this other stuff that we don't like, we're going to already screen that out. So it, in a way, yes, it's, it's positive. But it, it, it becomes positive because there's a pre-screening that says, oh, you know, we're not interested in the stuff we're not interested in. You know, and I would just argue that, that we did not have as strong a pre-screening in like the 19th century or the turn of the century where people were excited, provoked by reading reviews that were evaluated and that could be mixed or that could be somewhat negative. I would say the pre-screening came in with the attempt to create arts pages and to turn arts reviewing into a form of publicity. I mean, not just publicity, but an attempt to say, when you turn to our arts pages, you just want to read good news. I mean, you've got a certain number of leisure dollars you're going to spend, right? So you want to spend your leisure dollars this weekend, and this is why we want you to read our, our section, because we're just going to have positive things to say. It's all been pre-screened. All the, all, the all the bad art, or all the art we don't think you're worth, we haven't explained to you why we think it's not worth covering. We haven't explained to you why we think that art is not worthy. Just, just take our word for it. We pre-screened it, and we're only going to give you positive you know, reviews of the things that we think it's worth spending yeah, your money on. I, 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 I'm sorry, I don't mean to be combative. But, no, no, I, but, I, I, I welcome it. No, I, I, I think, though, that, that if you're distinguishing your local paper, they, they reveled in the bad reviews. I mean, how many movie reviews and, and pop reviews and, you know, I mean, all kinds of reviews, there, there are bad reviews. Those never went away. But when you're talking about 
sh shall I say, sort of high-end kind of more thoughtful writing, uh, I think that, that, that they did make a conscious choice to, to do that kind of pre-screening. But that, that consumer reports type of thing, which is the, the, the overwhelming majority of, of what has been in the arts press for 30 years, um, never shied away from that, that negative kind of. Well, I mean, I would argue that when you're talking about like pop music, you're talking about film. Now we're talking about, again, that, that divide between popular culture and sort of high culture. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of economics in that case. In other words, you covered a lot of movies because you had the movie ads that were coming into your newspaper or magazine or TV station. So that meant you, know, you wanted to cover, since there are all these big Hollywood film production companies that are sending all these, let's say, mediocre films out, you don't pre-screen those because they're buying ads in your newspaper but and magazine you want to cover them. Yeah, no, I agree, because they're a mass art that there's a vastly larger audience for them. And so you're going to, but you could pre-screen them. One of the implications of what you guys are saying is that not only that there was no golden age, <laughs> but you, you, sort, you sort of set the groundwork for the idea that once we begin to talk about what's happening on the internet, there is no, there can't be a falling off because you've in a certain sense been so uh, uh, dubious about, about the uh, idealizing claims for this older form of discourse. But I, the only thing I would add is that it's important to recognize uh, that this, it's oversimplified to talk about a split between so-called high culture and popular culture, but it's not oversimplified to talk about a kind of split in what we might call art, arts criticism that appears in places like the old defunct partisan review or commentary or the New York Review of Books mm -hmm. as against the kind of or the poetry magazine right. as against the kind of uh, uh, writing about arts that we would find in more popular places, even more generalized popular places such even the New Yorker, which probably occupies a kind of mid middle position between those between those and it doesn 't seem to me that the kind of discourse we 're talking about has declined that much in these in these what I'll call sort of high culture or literary environments. I mean, the, you know, the, the, uh, the poetry magazine is still publishing vituperative reviews by, 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 by uh, various uh, angry poet critics who uh, are very hostile to their contemporaries. And there's a great deal, you know, there's a great deal of, 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 of that kind of thing still going on. I mention that partly because I want to introduce a basic principle that, uh, that seems important for us to be thinking about as we discuss because we're going to move now to talking about what's happening on the internet with arts criticism, which is what these, what, what these folks really have something to, uh, important to tell us about, I think. Uh, let, let's re remember that if there is a kind of revolution, in quotation marks, going on, it's a very, very long revolution. <laughs> It's, it's really that, that uh, there clearly is hap it is clearly the case that virtually all the elements of what we might associate with, the, with, the, with print culture is migrating into digital form. But that process is going to take decades, if not centuries. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. There isn't going to be a sudden moment where we wake up in the morning and there are no, there's no longer any print discourse and all of the discourse is taking place on the web. There, there is, and there is also, as, as uh, uh, our speakers I'm sure will be able to illustrate for us, some kind of overlap between what goes on in print culture and what, and what goes on in the, in the, on the internet. So the, so the perspective I want to suggest is a perspective of continuity. That is to say, let's accept that big things are happening, but let's also recognize that they're not happening in a kind of revolutionary way, so that, so that uh, the old is suddenly uh, completely obliterated by, by new developments. Quite the opposite. The new imitates the old, takes its forms from the old, extends itself by modeling itself on its ancestors as, 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 before it begins to discover what is unique or special about the new media that are emerging in our own time. And if we keep that continuity principle in, in perspective uh, in, our, in our minds, it can help put many of the arguments that we'll be hearing this afternoon in, in context. Well, let, let's, let's turn, we've talked a bit then about some of the powerful limitations that existed even before the internet on forms of popular or generalized art crit arts criticism. Let's turn now to m more specifically what's happening um, to all these traditional formats for arts, arts discourse uh, because of the internet. How is the internet changing things? What are some of the decisive points that you guys would point to to uh, illustrate the ways in which it, 
the emerging digital culture, where, where this impending future that we're all moving into, whether we want to or not, how is, how, how is arts criticism altering and changing? So um, uh, I want to build on a couple of things that you've just said. Um, one is, is that, there are, that there are things that the traditional press never did very well in terms of covering culture, never covered dance very well, never covered community arts very well. I mean, there's a whole range of, of, of kinds of culture that the traditional press never found a way to either capture, pay attention to, or translate in, in a kind of interesting way. Um, and what we're finding now, there are you know, 300,000 arts blogs out there right now. 300,000 people who, who ha feel like they have something to say. It's not to say that they all do really, in fact, have something to say. <laughs> But that there is, there is a desire out there to engage in a kind of conversation. The second thing I wanted to, to, to bring up is that you, you said that it's sort of a gradual thing over a long period. I actually would disagree with that. I seem to be the, the panel disagreer here today. Um, I think that, that we're undergoing a revolution in the larger culture right now. I mean, I think that the ways that people are using culture, um, the ways that people are making culture, the expectations for how they get it, uh, how they use it, and how they want to participate in it um, are, are, are really radically changing. Um, we're going from an era where it's been essentially a broadcast model, where whether I'm a theater, or I'm a musician, or I'm a journalist, I have something to make. You, the audience, come and see it. And then I say goodbye to you, and you go off, and you, you do your thing. Now it's, it's a much more interactive kind of thing. And because people have access suddenly to the entire world, it seems, and there are you know, thousands and thousands of choices for how you want to spend your time or what gets your attention, um, that, that that conversation is, is basically changing. And what the, what the studies in uh, cultural choice tell us right now from, from um, the Curb Center at Vanderbilt and, and USC's um, Center for the, the Digital Future is that uh, younger people particularly are not going online to find information anymore. They're going online to have community. They're going online to be interactive and to have interactive experience. So they tend to, the, the studies also say that they tend to trust less those kinds of, of uh, media that they, um, that they have interaction with that have closed editorial um, systems. So in other words, we distrust, they, they distrust things which uh, are the expert kind of, of um, uh, analysis that I'm just telling you this and you do with it what you want. They tend to trust more things in which they can participate in, in the editorial experience. And it's not just to talk about things, either. It's uh, in, in creating things. A recent Pew study says that something like 89% of everybody under the age of 25 makes art on the internet in some way. They do want to have that interactive experience. So if the culture is changing radically like that, I, I believe, and we're going back actually not to something that, that has never happened before. I think this is a continual kind of reinvention that happens every time new technology is happening. We've, we've undergone it many, many times before in history. But it is still fundamentally different. Um, that if, if that culture is changing and how people are going to approach culture and interact with culture is changing, then the journalism around it necessarily has to change in pretty significant ways. And that means not having that kind of expert from afar kind of association. People want to have, uh, people like expertise still, but they also want to have some sort of interaction with it. Well, uh, let me build on a couple points. One point that David made. I mean, I do think we're in an in a, in a age of transition. And uh, Doug was talking about, you know, everyone is making art and the interest in art. I would say we're also at, we're in an age of transition of how we articulate our reactions to and evaluate what art means to us. And in that way, I'm with David in the sense that I think that there needs, in this transition, there needs to be some taken from the old and brought into the new. Because as I mentioned before, if I think criticism, and I believe it is, it is, evaluate, it is judgment with evaluation then the biggest thing I see missing in a lot of going on in, in writing about the arts is the evaluative act. 
We have people describing, we have people reporting, we have people emoting, you know, we have people opinionating. They have opinions, but they have no ability, apparently, to articulate, to react to the art in a way which can communicate to others in a reasonable way why the art made them feel the way they feel, why they value the art. Now, to me, and this is one thing we missed in talking about the value of arts criticism, part of what arts criticism has always been about, at least ideally, I, you know, I agree that it's, there's been a lot of potholes along the way of history, is that if we articulate the importance of the arts to us, the value they give us, the value they give our lives in order right, to communicate that importance, that value to the culture and the society at large. In other words, you, need, you can see a great performance. You need to be able to articulate about how you came to your conclusion about why that performance was so great to others, to share it to others, and also simply to make that become you know, part of the culture. It's about art articulating. So what we need, the, the articulation aspect is what we need to sort of transition from the past when there were expectations under sort of editorial guidance that when you opened a review, you would read, a, ideally, you read a review that not only gave you a judgment, but also gave you, also evaluated it. That seems to be slipping to me in what's going on in what we're talking about in the, in the three million blogs or 3,000 hundred blogs that we have writing about the arts. People who are reacting to the arts, people who are making the arts, but are unable, apparently, because they really don't have an idea of what reviewing criticism or articulating value is, to be able to put that into some sort of language. So I'd say that's part of it. But the part I gave with, with Doug is that it is a, the interactive part I find the most exciting part of what's happening now. Because through the interaction, it seems to me that is where those who can articulate, right, can, can train, educate, learn from those who need or are struggling to or who want to articulate what the arts mean to them. You know, and that then becomes part of, on, that becomes part of the internet culture, also becomes part of the society and the general culture. So it's that connection that I see the interaction can bring between those who can articulate and those who want to. I mean, because I see a great need in a way. I mean, a lot of, when I teach at, a, at BU, I have a lot of students who, they have reactions, they have opinions, and they actually become interested in the idea. They realize that they have an opinion, and then they begin to realize that they have to learn ways in which to artic articulate that opinion to give some the listener or whoever the reasons behind that opinion in order to share their insight, to make that valid, make that clear to the person who's, who's listening. So to me, the interaction brings about the connection between the professionals and the non-professionals, hopefully in a, in a place where both will feel free to be able to exchange opinions and views and learn from one another. So to me, the top down, I'll just went quickly, I mean, I think the blog is an interesting form, but I must admit, when I look at a lot of blogs, and I'm not saying all blogs, a lot of blogs are still, they get comments, the comments sit there, right? The comments are sort of badges of honor. Gee, I said something and I got a lot of comments. Where's the community? The critic doesn't talk to the people who are commenting. The critic doesn't try to make them part of the blog by saying, hey, come on and explain more about what you say about this art or that art. Essentially, it's just numbers, right? I wrote a blog in which I got so many reactions. And what really needs to be done, the next step is probably going to be finding ways to be able to bring the blogger together with the people who are already interested. They're responding, right? And use that space to be able to create the, talk about, you know, to create the means of articulation and training of both that, that need to be done. So I don't see enough interaction in, in criticism. Let's, let's complicate this argument about interaction a little bit because, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking of what I would think of as sort of more traditional forms of activity on the, by, on the internet that also involve a modicum of interactivity, not the same kind of interactivity that would be involved in the notion that someone would put up a, uh, a piece of prose fiction and invite his, uh, his or her readers to write a chapter. To me, a very dubious kind of interactivity, actually. But I, I can, I can certainly. I mean, I've seen texts that that that, that have emerged like that. But uh, a more modest kind of interactivity of the sort that occurs all over the place on the internet, maybe even larger uh, in terms of numbers than what you get from blogs. I'm thinking about the way in which traditional media like the New York Times have a presence on the web, and after virtually every article, not just their articles on the arts, there's a readers' forum, and there are elaborate commentaries and discourse. 
discourse amongst the readers. That's a form of interactivity that, that uh, grows out of a very traditional kind of media arrangement. But the Times realizes now that it's online. It has this new option. I, I, I think we ought not to be too quick to, to uh, denigrate or ignore these more modest forms of interactivity, because I think they're quite exciting. They be, what they do, in effect, is they invite the readers of the commentary to react and to disagree or to enlarge or to, or, 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 or to carry the argument in different directions. And I'm, I, I mentioned the Times because, of course, it's a, a, a very important web presence already, but it represents this continuity principle to me. And I think, it's, I, I think that there are many other examples of this sort of thing on the, on the web. Uh, uh, one other example I want to mention that I find actually very inspiring because, of course, one might think of poetry as the oldest art since it began before print, before, before language, before writing, actually. People were reciting poetry in the, in, in the era before the alphabet. Um, uh, and yet, uh, one might make an argument for the idea that the net is reinvigorating certain, for, certain ac access to poetry in ways that have never been possible before a kind of marriage of the old and new that I find very inspiring. And my example is the wonderful uh, monthly discussion on Slate run by the former poet laureate Robert Pinsky. Uh, every, every, month in, every, every week in Slate, Pinsky, as the poetry editor, publishes a poem by a contemporary poet. And in three of the four weeks, it's just that poem. And readers are encouraged to comment on it. But on, in the fourth week, and, and in fact, every poem that's published in Slate is then followed by a very elaborate sort of discourse about the poem by a, by a community of poetry lovers. But every, every fourth week, Pinsky publishes a poem from the past that's out of copyright. Poems by Sir Walter Raleigh, by Shakespeare, by Sir Thomas Wyatt. Uh, by, by, by lesser known poets as well, writes a brief introduction and then encourages people to discuss the poem. Those are among the most interesting forms of discourse about poetry that I think I've ever read. And one of the reasons for it is a, an astonishing number of practicing poets take, take part in those discussions. Uh, this is simply one example. And I, or those of you who don't know about this, even if you have only a modicum of interest in poetry, you might take a look at these at these. Uh, 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 monthly sessions, they're all, they're all archived on, on the Slate site, because they, they seem to me to represent an immense enlargement of what we might think of as traditional forms of discourse about poetry. Again, a kind of partly a continuity argument. So, so, I, so I would, again, qualify what you guys are saying, even though I don't actually uh, in any way disagree with, with, with the basic thrust of your argument. See, I, I, I think human nature doesn't change. I think the, the reason that we have you know the the reason we 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 have all of these um, uh, all of this vocabulary that tells us you know in media this story is more important than that story. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to that. Um, you know if something's on a one in an important newspaper, we know it means something. If it's on page twenty two, and you know we know it means something else. We have that in spades on on the internet. There are all sorts of ways, but it's a, it's a different kind of vocabulary. But it's a very strongly articulated vocabulary, and it's one in which you actually have to take an awful lot of labor to learn. You can't just make the switch overnight. So that's, that's part one. Part two is that I think that the values of traditional journalism, of traditional arts journalism and criticism and, and all of that, we have developed them over an awfully long time. They don't suddenly just disappear because we have, you know, we have a, a shiny new tool to play with. Um, and we they want them to disappear. That's right. And, and, and they will be re-articulated and reimagined in, in some very interesting ways. But I think that those values will continue to re-exert uh, re themselves as we go along. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. I, I guess I'm just a you know, maybe I'm more impatient to the extent that, uh, you know, I see uh, generation, you know, a generation of, uh, of students now that they really don't know what a review is. In other words, if you're not given that sort of uh, you know, exposure to a review, you know, in other words, you don't, you know, the typical newspaper review or whatever, and you would get it in your hometown paper and at least know what a review was. If you see what passes for reviews on YouTube or a number of other, you know, a three minute video, video, sometimes, a, you know, videotape rant. Uh, then the idea is that you're, they don't know that it's what eva reasoning, evaluation with reasoning means. They really don't. In other words, I do think, I'm not, I am optimistic 
ultimately. But I think the struggle, so I guess your transition, I think I, I, I'm, a bit of a, I'm a bit of a revolutionary in that way. I do think that these values that you're talking about are not just going to sort of naturally sort of pop up. I think you know, people who work on the web and write about the arts on the web have to actively put, you know, make, put those values forward to make sure that they're not contributing to, to people who really no longer know what a review is. The definition of a review becomes like what they saw in Siskel and Ebert. I mean, that essentially is what, really, it's what for a lot of uh, younger people, that's what a review is. You, you have a movie clip, and you say whether you like it or you don't like it, and then you have another movie clip and you say thumbs up or thumbs down. They see it purely as a consumer guide sort of option and not about as evaluative reasoning. And so, and if, they, if they're not exposed to it, if they're not talked to about it, if they're not shown what a review can do and the power of it and how it can be illuminating, then, you know, I mean, I, 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 I'm with you, but I'm just saying that I'm, we need more people to assert those values to make sure that, that the, the generations can continue that transition. I, I, what you say makes sense, Bill, and I'm sure you're right about that. But as you were talking, I was thinking, for example, about the, I, we, what you, let's call them reviews in quotes, uh, that you see on Amazon, right? The fact of the matter is if you read through the responses to particular texts on Amazon, it's very easy. Uh, no reader could possibly fail to recognize which responses are actually really substantial, respond to the content of the text in a way that you find persuasive, and as against those that are just puff pieces or so totally subjective that they're useless to someone else. And I think that some of that is good. That, that's, so there's some element of kind of self-education happens uh, because as, as people have get more and more practice, practice with blogs and with responses of the sort you find on, on Amazon after uh, uh, particular uh, comments on particular books on, on Amazon you be, and so many other places on the web where things like that occur, you begin to develop your own sort of critical standards because you're forced to. You, you know that you can't, you can't believe everything that you read and some of what you read seems so silly that you immediately dismiss it. So while I agree, Bill, and I would like all students to study either in my class or in Bill's class to, so we could teach them how there are actually actually some objective standards that one could use to begin to talk about what constitutes an effective, uh, effective or powerful forms of art, I think it's also possible that people begin to sort of educate themselves through, through a process like that. Well, I agree. What, I will say about just about Amazon, just because we haven't even talked about or we touched on the issue of independence or ethics. And that's, I know a number of highly articulate people who have written reviews of books that are competing with their book and they have put it under another name, and they have deep-sixed, very articulately, very thoughtfully, the book that, is, that essentially may be taking some of the market share away from their book. So I agree, but I want to say that without, as we are, we are back in Poe's Wild West days here, and you cannot necessarily, as articulate as a review may be, it can also be compromised, corrupt, and, this is, and the web is one way in which you can use perhaps a modicum of intelligence to look, you know, to to make your point in a in a very let's say underhanded or devious way, and so that's it, that's the problem without any sort of editorial control. Do, do both of you guys feel that that uh, the opportunity for this kind of abuse is more common on the web than earlier? And w one reason I mention that uh, is to reinforce something Bill said at the very beginning. Uh, we tend to idealize the past, but the fact of the matter is that the more we learn about the history of the reception of literature, the more we discovered that this kind of corruption was endemic. Uh, many of you may not know this, it's sort of an embarrassment to people who love James Joyce, but James Joyce interfered with and took uh, and, uh, uh, the reception of his books in all kinds of ways. He actually wrote reviews of his books under other names. He, he had books published under the names of friends of his that mostly were his work. Uh, he, try, he tried his best, this great, you know, this, the pivotal figure of modernism, a, no doubt a very great writer, was very concerned with his reputation and had no conscience at all about trying to sort of uh, 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 enhance his reputation in, in, various, in various published forms. And of course this is not a unique situation at all. There are, there are hundreds of stories uh, uh, about this, some of them about our most admired and respected uh, uh, art, uh, writers and artists from the past. Yeah, a quick one, only that, you know, I'm a big fan of Edgar Allan Poe. I think he was one of the, great, the greatest American critic of the 19th century. But he routinely reviewed his own works anonymously. In fact, Poe being Poe, he once reviewed one of his own works anonymously and panned it. 
He, uh, he also did a wonderful review of Nathaniel Hawthorne, in which, he, in which after saying how great Hawthorne was, he then had a chunk of a short story saying, I think Hawthorne, for all of his greatness, plagiarized from this story in order to make some of his stories so good. And of course, the story that he said uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne had plagiarized from was by Edgar Allan Poe, William Wilson. So uh, I don't really think, in terms of just the, the Wild West uh, ethics of it, uh, I think that online is not all that different than what Poe had to deal with in the, in, the, in the 1830s, 1840s, where reviews were anonymous, where, in fact, I think it's actually a little better because I haven't heard of anyone getting killed over a review. I haven't heard of any duels. Routinely in Poe's day, if you wrote something very vituperative and personal, and they did all the time, including Poe, someone would, you know, the fellow critic would find you in a, you know, having a drink somewhere, invite you out, and people were either A, brought into court, or they were killed. And some critics did end up bloody, bruised, and even dead. If uh, once they found out anonymously, you see, they would find out through the editor who really wrote this review and panned my book, and they'd, they'd go out and draw blood. So I think we're a little better than that. I haven't heard of any, unless Doug's heard of any death through criticism online. No, but I, I, I do think that, that one, one problem right now, and it is a wild west out there, is that whereas you know, in the last 50 years, let's say, um, there were some pretty bright lines that were drawn about you know, <laughs> what is ethical and what is it not ethical, which is not to say that, that people didn't cross back and forth across them all the time. But there was at least a sort of understanding that there is this kind of ethical you know, divide here. I think that a lot of people writing now, they don't even have, uh, they're not even aware when something is unethical. You know, somebody pimping for their own thing, somebody, you know, uh, uh, pushing a friend's book. I think there are a lot of people who, who, who are writing and think they're, they're being completely ethical, and, and they have no idea. So in, in, in one way, it's we, even if nobody, even if a lot of people or a lot of publications didn't follow the ethical rules of the past, there were at least ethical rules of the past. And I'm not so sure that those have been articulated in, um, in any kind of compelling way that's been, been widespread um, adopted. Well, we, we only have a few minutes left in our conversation before we open it to the audience. Let me ask you to be, uh, each of you to be more, a, a little bit more specific. Pick, pick some element of arts criticism on the web uh, or a site on the web that you think uh, uh, illustrates positive and hopeful directions in, the, in this you go first. Uh, well, we recently, uh, I, I recently helped organize a, a thing at um, uh, USC uh, as a summit on, on um, arts journalism, state of arts journalism. And one of the things that we tried to do was to find, I mean, it came out of this idea that, that we uh, saw hundreds of new sites uh, launching and uh, a lot of people trying to solve various problems. And so, um, you know, wouldn't it be great to get 10 ideas out on the table and let's, let's take a look at it. We uh, opened it up, people could nominate sites, and we got 109 nominations of sites to, to participate in this. What was interesting for me was that there was no site out there that really had figured out a model, a thing that, that is particularly working right now. Some of them had something very interesting going. In some way, there's a, a site by the, by the name of Flip Media, F-L-Y-P, uh, that's trying to reinvent the magazine for the digital world. And it's, it's using all sorts of very interesting design and graphic and interactive uh, things. for. Um, but there are problems with content and, and you know, it's, it's not fully realized yet. Uh, there's a project called Departures, uh, KCET, the, the public television station in, in Los Angeles, where they'll go to a neighborhood and they'll put people, um, uh, they'll try and capture the culture, culture of that neighborhood by doing a whole series of in interviews and embedding them in a collage of images of the street. And by the way that they choose them and by the way that they, they um, order them, you get a pretty good sense or you get a sense of what's happening on the street. But there's a critical element missing. Um, there are sites that are doing, that, that, that are doing criticism, pure criticism, uh, essentially transferred from the traditional print model to, uh, to online. 
um, and they seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, Glass Tire in, in tech, does Texas art. San Francisco Classical Vice does um, classical music in, in the Bay Area. And in some of these places, there are cities now, like San Francisco, where classical music is better covered now than it ever has been before. Because you have these sites that are going, they've, they've uh, uh, developed a whole cadre of you know, 40, 50 people who will go out and review and, and, and actually know something about what it is that they're talking about. Um, and, um, and do it in kind of an interesting way, in a comprehensive way, which the local newspapers have never, ever before been able to do. So here and there, you see sort of glimmers of things going on. Um, the, thing, the, the things to me that aren't happening, uh, one is uh, nobody has figured out a business model yet. I mean, at, at heart here, what we're talking about is a failure of a journalistic model to support arts journalism, to support any journalism, frankly, but to support, specifically support arts journalism. And while you have some sort of struggling models out there, nobody has really kind of figured out a way that, that, that is, is, is going to propel it forward in a, in a way that can be replicable uh, in a lot of communities. The other thing is, is that with all of the technical uh, uh, facility and the various media that we have available now, uh, for the most part, most of the stuff that's happening out there um, continues to be some sort of, of reinvention of something we're already doing. In other words, the, 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 there is this idea out there that the 500 word critical response, text response to a piece of art is somehow the perfection of the critical response. And I would suggest that, that you know, if you're describing dance, um, every time you try to, to describe what's happening or to make uh, judgments about it, it's a compromise to translate it into verbal language. Maybe there are better ways in different media to be able to capture or to react to, to make that crit critical response. And there isn't nearly enough going on. I mean, I, I can point to lots of examples of, of little things, but nothing that sort of, you sort of go, oh, that's such a better way of trying to, to <coughs> respond to a piece of art. That, well, one reason that's such an important point, it seems to me, is that uh, uh, w w there are certain forms of criticism. Dance criticism is a wonderful example, but so is film criticism. Theoretically, the web enables forms of dance and film criticism, even of drama criticism, if you could <laughs> film the performance, that allows you not to fall back simply on words, but to actually look at the physical movements of the performer and draw conclusions on the basis of that, or just call attention to, to certain things. And the web uh, 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 enables, let's say, a form of film criticism or a form of dance criticism that never existed in print media earlier. And are, you're suggesting that, in fact, that hasn't been exploited as richly yeah, as it I should mean, in, be. In music, for instance, but maybe if you're trying to describe the texture of a sound, maybe a visual image describes it yeah, in a better yeah. way than, than, than... Or maybe just yeah. hearing the sound, which, yeah. you, right. which you're also... Yeah, I, just, I, I mean, this ex, uh, excites me only because I really, I, I completely concur. I mean, it seems to me that that's why I'm optimistic and, optimistic and excited about arts criticism, because it seems to me that if you use the technology, if you use the multimedia, if you experiment with what articulating your response to the arts means, then it seems to me that's going to be an important part of the future. And for some reason, and I don't know why, and it's awfully frustrating, we don't see enough attempts to use, for example, in dance, actually to use video, to integrate that with whatever, you know, with a podcast, video cast, whatever you want to do to integrate actually seeing something and then evaluating it, describing it, and, you know, and illuminating it, hopefully, uh, forever, who's, forever, who's wa forever who's watching. So um, I agree with that entirely, that that, for some reason, I don't know why, that, that challenge, and it is a challenge, and that's another thing why I'm sort of revolutionary. I mean, that's a challenge that should be taken up by people who are interested in arts criticism. When I teach at BU, um, they say, for example, the graduate, the comm department at BU, or, you know, journalism J school, when, they, when people write in their applications for graduate school, what kind of thing do they want to do in journalism? The majority of them want to cover the arts. They want to cover the arts. They want to write about the arts because it interests them. So it seems to me that's where the energy, the ideas, are partly going to have to come from, from people who are familiar with the technology and can literally reinvent the form of the arts review as long as you keep at least one eye on that idea of the past and the idea that one has to articulate some sort of evaluative you know, you have to have reasons to behind your, your judgment. But I think you can easily marry that with 
the things that you're both talking about in terms of art articulating how you respond to uh, work of art. Well, let's conclude our part of the conversation, get your questions and arguments ready, audience, with, uh, 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 with my asking each of you briefly to talk about the sites you're responsible for and what you're, what you're up to with your sites right, and why. Well, good. Here's my, here's my, you know, I get my commercial in here. Uh, I, my, I did the Art Fuse, which is at a, uh, in, as you can see the site up there, and uh, it's essentially uh, dedicated to covering uh, re arts in New England. It, it, it focuses on critical responses, although not only on those. Um, the thing I want to highlight now is, as you can see, Judicial Theater Review number one. This is my attempt, again, to experiment, not so much with technology, but to experiment with the idea of creating a sense of, of dialogue and civic community online. So what I've done is I've taken the US Supreme Court as a model. And essentially what I do is that I send out a number of judges to, in this case, it was to a theater piece. Uh, one of them is a professional, you know, not all of them are professional critics. Some of them is, is specialized in the subject matter that the play was about. They came back with their judgments. I edited them. I posted them. I then give you a, if I can get you to see this or not. Thank you. Oh, I got to hang on for a second. So I edited them, so I have a little preface explaining what this is. There's a majority opinion, a dissenting opinion, then I have the different judges. There are their judgments. Then I have the, the artistic organization, then has a friend of the court brief. So <laughs> the idea is to create a community where you can have three different points of view, because all the judges were somewhat different in how they saw the show, and they're coming up from different points of view. And you're including the response of the artistic, uh, you know, in this case, the theater company that was involved in a place where, because not all the judges loved the show. They actually were somewhat missed about it. They mixed about it. They thought it was an important play about an important subject, in this case, Rwanda and genocide in Rwanda. But it, the, you know, the characters and the plot had problems. Yet the artistic, the, the community, the, the artistic institution, in this case, Company One, felt comfortable enough about posting and responding. This is, to me, my attempt to try to create a community, because I want people who respond, and I invite anyone here, please, to read and respond, to become part of this community talking about this play, and maybe eventually, at some point, becoming a judge. You know, in other words, getting on a panel. And a panel also can be taken from local communities. So I could have judges or panelists coming from all over the state that could become part of you know, covering this particular event for their community. So it's an attempt to create this sort of communal space that will bring together professionals, people who articulate about the arts sort of for a living or used to, and then those people who are interested in articulating their responses to the art in a place where everyone can feel, because it is, there is an edited quality to it, meaning I am editing the material. I don't want comments on there that are, that are demeaning or stupid or insulting. I'm not interested in snark. What I'm interested in is actually seriously talking about in this case, this play, and hopefully involving a community of people who can trade ideas and views on it. So this is, this is what I edit, and this is my latest idea uh, to try to reinvent the art form by combining the professional the, with the non-professional and trying to create a community around that. So that, that is the arts views. Oh. Um. I edit um, something called artsjournal.com. Um, we just had our 10th anniversary. Um, we started in September of 1999. Um, and um, what Arts Journal was an attempt to do, uh, I, I actually came up with it when I was uh, browsing in the Philadelphia Inquirer site one time, one day, and. Um, um, uh, discovered a story about the Barnes collection being in, in difficulty and um, uh, realized that, that, that it was a couple of, uh, they don't need to Where see to put it. Art, so you don't need to they see it. Don't need it. To okay. see it. Um, uh, that it was in trouble, but it was a couple of weeks old. And so I thought, there are probably stories like this all over the place. Um, and if I could just put them together, I could have my own art section. Uh, that was on a Tuesday. Um, on a Wednesday, I registered the name and bought some, some books on HTML and, and uh, spent the weekend kind of putting it up. And it launched on the Monday, and it's been going for 10 years. Um, 
We have bloggers on the site. We have 64 bloggers currently. Um, most of them are ex-newspaper people or <laughs> still newspaper people, um, all with kinds of various kinds of followings uh, across all of the arts. What Arts Journal does, sort of its main function, is we, we look at uh, about 200 publications worldwide, anything in English, every day. Uh, about 1,500 to 2,000 stories every day, and then we boil it down to the 20 to 30 that we think are, are interesting and that you ought to know about. Um, and then we have all of these other blogs. We also uh, curate discussions, so we'll invite the 12 people you'd like to hear on a topic, and they'll blog about it for a week um, and go on. We're in the midst of completely reinventing the site. I, I don't think that what Arts Journal is right now um, is going to be viable going forward. Um, uh, we have about 50 to 60,000 people a day that use the site. Um, I found uh, two years ago when I redesigned it the last time, um, I was kind of surprised to discover that only about 25% of the people who actually use it ever come to the website. In fact, the vast majority of people don't even know it's a website. Uh, they're getting it in newsletters. We've got you know, 35,000 newsletter subscribers or um, in feeds, or they're encountering it in other sites, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that the challenge in journalism right now is we, we have too much information out there. Although somebody told me recently, it's like there's not more information now than there ever has been. It's just our access is to it is, is more comprehensive. So the challenge now is not to create so much more information. It's to find ways to make the information that we have coherent and put it together in some interesting ways. So the, the new version of Arts Journal I'm moving towards is more community-based, where you'll be able to curate what it is that you want to see in, in various levels. So you can get the very highly curated thing that we do now, but then there'll be different levels of curation with the involvement and interaction of the community, which is actually very smart. Yeah. So. Didn't you also tell me that, you're at, that your site actually makes money? Yeah. Uh, we, this we, seems an important point. <laughs> <laughs> we launched in September of 1999 at the height of the dot-com bubble. Uh, a month later, the New York Times wrote about us, and that, that helped. Uh, and about a week later, uh, uh, somebody called, a company called up and says, we can make you a millionaire for Christmas. Uh, you take that call. <laughs> um, and immediately, we started making money. Were they we, telling the truth? Yeah, they were. So um, you're a millionaire? <laughs> no, because I didn't oh sell God. it. <laughs> um, uh, they, they, that was the day, those were the days in Web 1.0 where uh, you know, content is king. So everybody was desperate for content. So we could sell feeds of our content um, to all sorts of clients. Um, and so we grew rather, rather large. In a six-week period in April of 2000, um, um, all of a sudden, every one of our clients went out of business, including the people who had, had offered the million dollars for the site. So it was a good <laughs> thing we didn't take it, right? Uh, because all of those you know, wild ideas, they, they, they really didn't pan out. Um, and what I've learned over time uh, in doing Arts Journal is that you can't, uh, you know, I thought it would be, I would find a source of revenue for the site, uh, and that would be it. That has not proved to be true. Uh, we sell subscriptions. Uh, people, people buy subscriptions to the newsletter, premium newsletter. Um, we have advertising. We have all, we supply news to other sites. There are a variety of ways, and there are times when, um, uh, one mode is generating most of our revenue, and the others are, are, are not, but it changes over time. And you have to be nimble enough to be able to, to go for the mix. Now we turn to the audience, and uh, uh, I, I urge you, what, uh, when you, uh, there are mic there's a microphone here. Is there another one on this side? Only yes, one there side? Is. No, there's, one on there's a microphone on either side. If you line up in front of the mics, I will call on you in order. Uh, identify yourselves before you speak so you can become part of the permanent record of the event. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Birch Quick, and I'm a grad student at Penn Central University. Is that on? Is that microphone on? I don't hear it. Yep. Okay. It's it is. Okay, I'll, I'll lean closer. Right. Um, and I was, first off, I'm really 
glad that you're here because you have a perspective that I don't often see on the internet. Um, in fact, to the point where I was wondering, do we share the same internet? Like, do we, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm beginning to think that maybe this is, is a sign of just a complete worldview difference, probably because of our generations. Um, I guess that the thing that I've been wondering as you continue talking about this, apart from occasionally wanting you to give examples such as blogs where the comments don't like lead to greater things, because I feel like I go to many blogs where the comments get involved. Yeah. But, but I start thinking, you know, you guys are, are very into this thing of expertise. You're very into expertise. You're into someone curating for you, is what I'm getting. You're into the idea that there are people who are experts, who there have been like created experts by a journalism school or wherever, which I think that there is value to this, by the way. Many of my friends are journalists. But you're into this idea of these people that we are going to return to their place, sort of, right? Like the web has, has destabilized this journalism thing, and somehow those of us who aren't experts are going to want to return the experts to their place, are going to want to like listen to the reviews of someone who has gone to journalism school and has their own, their own background, their own opinion, you know, and has heretofore been sort of on a broadcast model been telling us what they think without real, you know, with, with the major soapbox. They've got the big soapbox. I'm having a hard time understanding why I would want to do that. Why wouldn't I want to continue to educate myself as much as I can um, and, and form my own opinions and get into conversations and not look to one major, you know, reviewer or one central place or even a small panel of people, even, even a three-person panel, um, who may or may not share my own, you know, sort of goals as to what I should be listening to. And I understand that you guys are a small subset of what you would dream arts reviewers to be, but it still has seemed very, it has not seemed very uh, uh, internet-like to me, what you guys have been talking about. Uh, you want to go or, uh, 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 well, I, I, to me, I, I don't quite see, if you're going to, you want to go around and you want to educate yourself, then you're going to go to as many different sources mm -hmm. and you're going to educate yourself in as many different ways as you can. So this panel of three might be one way, Arts mm -hmm. Journal might be another. In other words, you're going to try to absorb and use and ultimately filter. Because right. unless you want to just continually go and, and go mm -hmm. through hundreds of blogs every day or every week, right. so that your part of your education process is that you are going to be becoming educated about those people whose ideas, opinions, matter to you and perhaps then you'll write to them and then you'll you'll create that relationship so i don't see the you know i mean how are you going to educate yourself you're going to be learning actively by going on the web taking what you need and discarding what you don't need yeah i i actually agree with you <laughs> okay um i i don't see that there's going to ever be a return to the expert i i, I wouldn't tout that as a model that we should you know want to go for. Um, I think that, that you know, the nichification of culture that's happened uh, means that that kind of broadly based mass culture in which you know, the mushy middle rules because it can, uh, you know, it can aggregate the most eyeballs is not a model that, that, that is ultimately going to be able to sustain itself. And we're seeing all of those kinds of mass culture lose audience mm -hmm. share, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent. I mean, all of those business models are failing. Um, that said, I mean, I, I, I spend, some of the most interesting people I'm reading these days are not journalists. They're people who are doing the things that they love and are studying it and, and have a, a way of expressing their point of view about it. In, in, in a way, they are experts in their thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, you value those with, with you know, uh, very much. Um, and so I, I think that the challenge is really to find curators that you grow to trust, mm -hmm. people who can filter for you and, and yeah. You know. I, I just, as you've been speaking, I realized that my main response, I think, was because you guys were talking about, oh, the many bloggers who are doing it wrong, and the many YouTube commentators who are doing it wrong. And my perspective is, hey, those are probably, you know, oh. young people who are trying to learn to do it right. What's I, wrong with them doing it wrong? You know? There's so many amazing blogs and, and things that, that you know, um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, lots of blogs are doing it right. I mean, I'm excited by the activity that, that I see going on. And, Look, I don't know, I didn't want to say they're doing it wrong. I think that they are on the process of getting hopefully better and better and better. I just think that if you see a sort of Siskel and Ebert-like review on YouTube, I'm hoping eventually that this critic will grow out of that model and will be able to write, you know, be able to write or deal with, them in, with film art in a far more sophisticated 
way, you know, more complex way. That's all. But I think for every one of those, there there is somebody who's doing yes, it in a complex there, way. There, yes, of course. You know, this whole this this whole sort of movement right now, doing response videos to things that you see online. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are just amazingly done, well done. Yeah. We obviously need to say more, and I hope both the panelists and the audience will uh, talk more about this broad question. Clearly, there is a kind of profoundly democratizing tendency uh, built into these new technologies. And there are both positive and negative implications of them. The positive implications may not have been stressed enough, but I do want briefly to respond to Flourish Klink's comments by reminding her that, there's, <laughs> that she's a very active blogger and, in fact, and in fact uh, especially active in, in, certain, in certain territories on the web. And she's listened to more than others are. Why? Not because someone designated her as an expert. Maybe we need this distinction. But because there's a difference between what we might call authority and and expertise. You get authority not because someone grants it to you, but because you write well and people start paying attention to you. That's why people read Flourish on Harry Potter more than the other Harry Potter uh, bloggers who, who come. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's, that, that's why presumably, hopefully, uh, particular, particular uh, participants in these, in these uh, endless forums will, be, will, will gener generate more views and more, and, more, and more responses than others do. Uh, if that's what happens, if, if that is going to happen, or, or, or if that is a prime tendency on the web, as I hope and believe it is or will be, I think that's a very healthy sign. It means that not that there won't be people whose, whose opinions or whose perspectives are, are not more valued than others, but they'll be valued because the authority they've generated has been granted to them by a kind of response by all of, it, all of the readers, or all of the users. That's all, that was part of the traditional idea of journalism. In other words, when journalists began writing reviews, you know, they might have been gotten the job, but if they became popular, admired, whatever, they, they had to fight. Um, hi, I'm uh, Nick Seaver. I'm a master's student in comparative media studies also. And I have a similar qu uh, question on a similar idea, but not so much about who is doing the criticism, but how. You talked a lot about how people aren't doing enough evaluative work or judgmental work and are mostly just like summarizing what happens and sort of puff pieces, and I'm curious if you could get more specific about how you see the evaluative function changing as criticism moves online, moves in these various ways with different people, because you talked expertly about the history of how arts journalism evolved over time, but there was this sort of implicit assumption that the role of the evaluator was somehow static in here, like the proper way of evaluating has been the same, and they used to be bad at it, and they got good at it, and then they were bad at it, and then they were good at it again. Um, but I'm curious whether you see that role, that evaluative function changing at all, like with the times, because I would imagine arts journalists from 1900 have, would have weird things to say about arts from, you know, 2009. To me, are you just this is to anyone this or? is to anyone. All right. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll take it and just. Um, I mean, I wish I had. A, I mean, I think you. That's a really pivotal issue for me. And in a way, I don't have an easy answer. I mean, that's sort of to me. That's what's being discovered right now. In other words, if we take the idea of what evaluative reasoning was in the 19th century, the 20th century, if you go back, and I would suggest if you are writing arts journalism or thinking about writing arts arts journalism online, read some of the great critics of the past. You don't have to imitate them, but they, are, they perhaps will give you the tools and the values to begin to think, wh what can I bring from the past to what's going on online now? What do I now have to do different, new, that wasn't done in the past? So we already talked about various uses of multimedia. Perhaps you could do a dance piece where you don't necessarily writing a 500, 600 word evaluation, but you're using video. You know, Maybe uh, reviews are going to go more towards a form of podcasting or videocast. And you perhaps will be working with ways in which one can place more evaluative material in it, either using visuals or using language. But to me, that, that to me is a fascinating challenge of what's happening today. What is it? And to, if we assume that evaluation is pivotal in what makes a review, then what can we, what can we transition from the past that will fit online you know, with what a lot of people feel are, you know, arrested attention spans and people who don't want to read long magazine-like pieces, what forms of evaluation can we bring that go beyond the sort of thumbs up and thumbs down or simply giving an opinion? So I don't have an easy, I think, I think this is what we're working on right now. It's what people are going to be, and unfortunately we haven't seen enough experimentation on that end in terms of how can we take evaluative discourse, traditional discourse, and place it online? What works? 
what doesn't work, what pleases readers, and what maybe doesn't please readers, but that you want to do anyway because it's challenging, because you are concerned with the craft of criticism itself, and you want to see what values you can bring from the past and bring it in, into today, and see what works and what doesn't work. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Dinah Carden, and I actually am one of the 300,000 um, <laughs> art blog people you talked about, although we don't like to think of it as a blog. It's an online arts magazine for the North Shore called Art Throb, based in Salem. And I teach at Salem State College, and I have interns there who are involved. And Doug, I was one of the 109 <laughs> uh, people to participate in your uh, online arts model in California, and I thought that was a great project. Um, Sitting here today, so many things that you've said are, um, I'm nodding along. Someone's mentioned a cadre of writers. That's what we call our, our writers as our cadre. And um, with dance, we've had a writer who is a dancer writing about dance, talking about um, how hard it is to write about dance. Um, and the idea of video is, is actually really good. Um, my background is in journalism um, from Boston University, but I I wouldn't want to see the written word go away because that is my background. I've been an arts writer on the North Shore and also um, worked in, as a staff writer in straight news, but the thought of it really scares me to imagine that you would go online and just see videos of people doing things because the last thing we need is for young people to literally live online and not go out and see for themselves um, what's actually out there. And one of the things that we're doing is building community with this publication. And, you know, we're already hearing, we're only six months old, that people are looking to us more than the mainstream publications for arts writing. Um, but I just would like to hear you talk about that, about we do a mixture of magazine pieces and also the, the brief 500-word uh, post and we're trying to be very multimedia. Um, I dream of NPR-style audio interviews. Um, and we do do video and, and other things. Um, but I just, from it coming from the, the background of the written word, I, I do want to continue to do that. I'd like to hear you talk about that. Yeah, I, I, I actually think that um, there's a, a recent book out, and I can't, can't remember the name of it at the moment, but making the case that, that we haven't become less literate in the age of texting, it's actually made us more literate. We're, we're now more literate now than we've ever been before. Because if you go back 20 years ago, once people got out of school, they never wrote anything again. Now you've got this proliferation of people writing, even if they're small texts. And it has its own kind of form. Um, I think in an odd way that uh, all of this really short hit stuff um, in some ways, it values the larger pieces. It, 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 it kind of reasserts them, their purpose. You know, um, when there was a forest of those kinds of pieces, probably not everything needed to be that long, and probably a lot of it was self-indulgent, and probably you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if the if the standard moves to something else. Um, there is, you know, when somebody attempts the longer form, I think that there's a, a more appreciative audience for it. Um, so uh, by, by no means am I, you know, saying, hey, we should, we should get rid of text reviews or that the text is not um, still the primary form of, of um, uh, critical response to something. All I'm suggesting is that, that um, with all of the options available right now. I don't see an awful lot of, of um, experimentation. You know, um, when people uh, attempt something, it's usually based on that kind of traditional model, and they try and shoehorn it into whatever it is. But you know, for instance, I recently saw uh, a review of a graphical novel. Graphical novels are really big right now, in the form of a graphical, um, you know, in the form of a graphical novel. You know, panels. This is kind of interesting. Um, you know, um, uh, music in response to music. Uh, movement in response to movement. Uh, you know, so, some of that's so ephemeral. That you, you, you know, what is it actually commenting on? On the other hand, you know, seeing some of these uh, response videos to some somebody dancing or somebody doing something on the web 
is pretty interesting because it's got a lot of commentary on what the original thing was, and it, it dissects it in some pretty interesting ways. Um, so I, I, yeah, I wouldn't say we want to get rid of text at all. I, I, I just think, though, that, that we have to be really clear about how it is that we're using text. Perhaps we should note parenthetically, it's, again, the, 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 di the, the utopian or dystopian discourses that surround new technologies always distort a more complicated reality anyhow. But one of the radical oversimplifications has to do with the death of language. <laughs> Clearly, language is migratory across platforms and will always endure. Language, it will be, what, however visual the net becomes, it will still be a medium of language. It will still be a medium in which people need to use the language. And the people who use the language well and effectively will generate more authority than those who do not. Can I make another point on that, too? You know, um, after uh, the Iran elections and there were all the uprisings and they wouldn't let um, uh, news organizations in? OK, for 50 years, our idea of the most compelling way of telling a story in real time has been the television clip, right? It's, it's the guy standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square. It's, it, it's incredibly compelling. We go to text to bat cleanup to find out what, it's, what it all means and to make the associations and set the context, right? So you get to these, these uh, uprisings, and there is no, really is no, no television. And what you have is people started Twittering. And um, at the height of it, there were 2,500 tweets a, a, a minute coming out. Um, and what was really kind of interesting to me about that is that um, the reality of television and that compelling visual image is you got the 40-second clip that you want to see. But then you got four hours of Wolf Blitzer droning on and on and on and on and on. And it's really boring. And you can't fast forward. You can't pick the pieces that you like. However, what happened with, with Twitter is that people started posting videos and started posting pictures. And other people started sorting them into, ah, here's the good stuff here. Ah, here's a report over here. And what you could do is, because text is scannable, and you can go through, and you can find out the parts that are interesting to you. It ended up being a much more compelling way of telling a story in real time, because you could pick the videos you wanted. You could pick the pictures that you wanted. And you could sort of impressionistically, at least, see what was, you know, see the main currents of what was going on. So it may be, ultimately, that text reasserts itself in terms of that real time kind of uh, a, a way to, to cover something. I'm the executive director of Stage Source, which is the Greater Boston Theater Alliance. And um, for the last 18 months or so, I've been working with some colleagues here in Boston, assessing um, the state of Boston arts journalism in the hopes to find an online arts journal solution, some sort of um, model that would exist for the Greater Boston arts, arts and cultural community. And so I'm curious, um, Doug, about your the, the summit that you um, organized and hosted, and, and you'd mentioned in your remarks earlier that there doesn't seem to be a business model out there that exists. And I wonder what um, who's doing work in this area to assess it, to do some research around this, who's talking about this, was there any sort of um, next steps that came out of the summit in terms of th this should be a priority? Um, one concern we have here in Greater Boston, or we had a big scare this year, was that uh, the Boston Globe, our you know primary uh, newsprint source for arts and cultural coverage, um, you know the threat was that it was going to go away. I know in Seattle, the this is the Post Intelligencer that's no longer in print, and so I, I'm curious really about some ideas and who's who is talking about this in terms of the future for models and opportunities? Well, first I should say that there are lots of models out there that actually are making money. I mean, Boing Boing uh, sells millions of dollars worth of ads a, a year. I think last year it was over $2 million, and there are three people who write it. Um, that's a model that makes money. Talking Points Memo started as a one-person blog, Josh Micah Marshall, um, now has something like 21 reporters that they're hiring. Um, that's a model that, 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 that works. Politico is a, is a model that works. I mean, there are starting to be 
a lot of models that work. Here's the problem in the arts, is that the readership, the, the, the eyeballs that you can attract are going to be smaller than the big political blogs. I mean, it's just a, a way that, that, that it works. Um, the genius of newspapers originally was that you aggregated all sorts of niches for which you couldn't have a daily, you know, you couldn't publish a daily crossword puzzle because, you know, the, the economics wouldn't work out. But bundle that with this and this and this and this and this. The reality is, is that people aren't buying the newspaper for, for brilliant coverage of City Hall, even though they appreciate that it's there and they will read it. Um, so you have to find, you know, the, the, the news business has always been a subsidized business. You know, your, your, the cost of your subscription barely pays for the, the, the printing and the delivery cost. It doesn't pay for the, 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 the news gathering uh, part of it. Um, so most of the solutions, most of the things that people have been trying in terms of arts have been um, very traditional in the sense of we'll, we'll hire reviewers or we'll get citizen critics and we'll put it online. Well, the reality is when you start looking at all of those sites is that if they get more than a couple hundred people a day, that's pretty amazing. And the fact is, is that you cannot sell enough advertising on a site like that to make it work. The current CPM rate, if you're really wildly successful, is, you know, I mean, the average out there is about 41 cents. That's, you get 41 cents for every thousand times an ad is shown. Um, if you're really lucky, you'll get five dollars, right? But, but some of these sites, some of these sort of metro sites, they say that they need about eighteen dollars to be able to, to make it. So, it, it, you know, so then you go down the other route. Is it going to be a nonprofit? And so do you incorporate and try and be in? Well, that creates a whole other uh, uh, set of, of things that you've got to deal with, which is, is, is not necessarily going to get you there either, although it might. I, I mean, you know, there, there are lots of people, there are lots of people trying it, lots of sites trying it. Um, so for me, the challenge is, is how do you network and aggregate enough readership to be able to build a community that's sufficiently large enough against which you can create a number of revenue sources, whether it's live events, whether it's added kind of ticket sale kind of thing, where whether it's uh, memberships, whether it's subscriptions, whether it's, you know, I mean, all, all of these things. Um, and until you get to five or 10 or 15 or 20,000 people a day, you can't even start to go there. The, the, the universe of people who actually want to advertise to that group is, is pretty small. Now, I will say, the, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel just laid off a, a good number of its arts writers, so only the visual art writers next. The classical music critic went to the, the venues at which he had been covering and said, hey, you know, why are you spending $300,000 advertising in, in the newspaper uh, when they're not going to cover you anymore? Come join my thing and throw us a third of that, and, and we're there for you. So I, I do think that there's a way in which um, uh, arts organizations, cultural organizations, uh, everybody's talking about this right now. So what are we going to do? And they're all approaching it in, in, you know, with, with, in a variety of ways. But I think that if you uh, were able to get a bunch of them together, that you'd find some, um, some, audience, some willingness to advertise and to support something. I'd like to add something here. One of the problems I think that Doug is talking about here has to do with the conflict between the global and the local, or the national and the local. There, it seems to me, it, it's clear in some degree that uh, the web has already demonstrated that because of its global reach, it can create communities that are not localized. The problem is that if you're talking about arts journalism of the sort our panel has been interested in, local arts communities, local arts organizations are min only marginally helped if there's a journal that talks about dance across the world or dance across the United States. So I think there is a kind of national audience for poetry, for dance, for drama criticism. The, pro the, pro the problem has to do with the way in which all of these activities are also localized in a way that requires support 
sport requires audiences. And I think the real question is whether or not the web is going to be viable as, a, as, an, as an environment to create these local communities as, as against the national communities. And one, one uh, footnote to what Doug was saying, again, I know about Slate because I, I know about, uh, Robert Pinsky is a friend of mine, and he's talked to me about his problems at Slate. One of the reasons that Pinsky went to the tradition of once a month doing a poem out of the public domain, so that, in the public domain, so he could publish it without pay, is that he wants to pay his poets. But of course, Slate counts the number of hits that come to each section of Slate. And guess what part of Slate gets the smallest number of hits? The poetry. So in order to preserve the poetry presence on Slate, one of the things Pinsky did was he said, OK, three times a month I'll have living poets and I'll pay them something for their contribution. And I'll use free poets who may actually also incidentally be much greater poets and we'll generate a discussion about them. And it's still not clear. I mean, I think he's quite worried about this. And since I've mentioned it, let me encourage all of you, if, if you just go <laughs> onto the site and look at what's there, you'll be helping poetry on Slate. Because if you're there, if there's a hit just looking at the poem. You don't even have to read it. If you, if you <laughs> click on it, that counts. And uh, you know, well, I've me, been encouraging my students to do the same thing. Let me, let, let me add just one other issue, too. As you said, the you know, Boston Globe could go out of business. You know, there is a, a school of thought. And uh, I'm not going to fess up whether I subscribe to this or not, but you can probably guess. Um, what, newspapers for a long time pretty much ignored the internet. I mean, they, they, they kind of did the absolute minimum kind of thing that, 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 that they could do. And they put very few resources into it. Um, they also had this ad base for print ads that was wildly overinflated uh, and based on, on this idea of a monopoly in a market. You can claim greater reach with a newspaper than anything else. So their way of dealing, one of the ways in which they have dealt with the news, with um, online, is to say, oh, you know, buy this really overinflated priced um, print ad, and we'll throw in the online ad for next to nothing, thereby establishing the value of the online ad as as being really, really low. Now imagine that the uh, I won't say Boston because. <laughs> But imagine the Seattle Times now goes out of business after the Post Intelligence series. And there, is predict there are predictions that uh, within a year, at least a couple of ma major American cities will be without a daily. Um, I would suggest that if that goes away, the ad rate will climb in those communities, possibly to a point where it would be sustainable, to, certainly to do more than, than is what, what is happening right now. But right now, we're in this kind of you know, period of, of artificial <laughs> disinflation um, for, for ads. The other thing is, and this is, this is sort of disheartening, is that when you, when you look at uh, how people click on ads, 8% you know, of the audience out there clicks on 80% of the ads. So it's a very small uh, group. And even though we can very specifically target where you are, um, both geographically and demographically now. Um, unfortunately, the people who come to news sites, and you can conjecture all you want for the reasons for this, they click on ads at a significantly lower rate than they do on regular website, on other websites. So people who are going someplace for news, they want that. They don't want to be interrupted by the ads. So there is greater resistance. So the, the, the click-through rate on ads on news sites is you know, one-tenth of one percent. That is, makes it a hard, um, a hard thing to, to, to sell. Hi, my name is Greg PC. And I was curious about the, the idea of, if you know of examples, I mean, you talked about Poe writing his own reviews. You, you talked about you know, active poets on Pinsky's column contributing. Are there examples of, of artists, of creators, of dancers, of poets creating content and then encouraging critical review and then engaging that and trying to build a community around the criticism of their work? Are you seeing that anywhere? I mean, not engaging with fans, right. but actually trying yeah. to engage active criticism of themselves. 
I, there are, I think there are, there have been examples of this. I, my, my guess is that some of my some of my CMS students might have better examples than I than I know. But so I, I seem to recall that Stephen King began to publish a book on the on the web, and waited for responses, encouraged responses from his audience before he con continued it. Uh, and I remember reading articles about this as if it was a uh, you know a, a, a really sort of a, a radical transformation. I think it didn't have that impact. That was but, the number of people who would buy, who would yeah, pay, who would pay. Yeah. Is that yeah, would pay. Right. That's the, that's the fan. Yeah, that's, that's the fan, fan base. Yes. I, I, so I, it's certainly a good idea, but I'm not aware of a I lot. I think it's of a good it. idea. I, I mean, maybe Doug's aware of them. I haven't seen anything like what you're describing, where you know someone is actively engaging with with criticism of their own work online. Although I've seen bits and pieces of it when they've responded to comments, but I haven't seen it. I don't know. Maybe there. I haven't seen continuing con you know critical there are, conversations. There are, there are actually a lot of sites out there like that. Um, uh, Go to eHarlequin.com, you know, Harlequin Romances, right? They've created this amazing community where you can upload pieces of your book. I mean, everybody thinks they've got a trashy novel in them, right? Um, but it's a way of interacting, both getting criticism, but also you get to work with their writers, and they tell you, you know, what's effective and what's not effective. Um, you know, Pitchfork has, has in, Pitchfork, admits, yes. in music, yeah. has a lot of sort of interaction. And there are lots of, you're going to tell us about a couple more right Yeah, now. good, yeah. I've been actually, waiting for Florida. There are many, many places in which authors actually interact, not just with fans, but with, with other people. Mostly, I think, because there are more and more authors coming out of writing online, um, which I think is a fantastic thing, as, as Professor Thorburn already knows. Um, for instance, uh, Naomi Novik, who writes a fairly popular, I mean, this is mostly sci-fi and fantasy authors, largely speaking, not necessarily interacting with fans, though, but with everybody who is, who is in a conversation about this. Because whenever you say sci-fi and fantasy, people go, oh, those nutty fans at those conventions. Well, that's part of it, but, but not all. Um, who else? Uh, God, I can't even think of how I can't even think of who I should say because there are so many people. E. Harlequin is a great thing, but also elsewhere in the romance world, there's huge conversations, which is funny because people say, "Oh, the romance novel world, they're so their genre, they're so the same thing. Nobody really cares about what's in it." Well, yeah, their genre, but people care about different things within that. You know, they aren't trying to make high art anyway. And games. I mean, they're well, an amazing sort of gaming. Well, we've said nothing about games, although yeah. there are people in the audience who know a lot about it. And we've really said nothing about fan communities, which, we, uh, although Flourish has been implying it. And of course, fan communities are an incredibly creative environment in which people are collaborating and creating all kinds of exciting And they're not things. necessarily purely, you know, sycophantic, of let me point no. out. Of course. Good. Well, the live art is harder. I mean, again. Just talk into the mic because you're not. In the, in the live arts, dance, theater, music, it's more difficult because you're you're sort of going against what the you know live art. I mean, you're you're actually one step removed by projecting it on you know YouTube or whatever, unless you're live casting it, which is a which is quite different, I think. Well, there are sites like The Winger, for instance, which is started by a New York City ballet dance uh, uh, dancer, uh, and now has dancers from all over the world. And they interact and they talk about each other's work. And, and but that's and not, I mean, we are talking about critical discourse here. And as such, that does raise another problem, you know, where you're going to, act, when you're talking about, let's say, theater performances or music or whatever, then, uh, you know, often you can find, um, I guess, conversations between artists and with each other, or artists with, you know, with readers or contributors. But they tend to be very sort of bland and safe, and they tend not to have any real critical. Evaluate it because everyone wants to keep, you know, no one wants, you know, no one wants to say anything that's going to be taken, you know, taken as being too critical. So I find them to be, you know, I mean, I would, you know, I, I find them often to be somewhat, you know, somewhat toothless rather than really getting to a, a critical conversation where people can be respectful but can make real substantial critical points about an artist's work. And I find them awfully, they're all, they're very policed. And sometimes if they're sponsored by or have ads by very arts organizations, <laughs> That are, you know, then then that immediately creates this sort of, you know, an ethical barrier and a, a financial and a reluctance to uh, to really speak honestly, frankly, and uh, you know, critically. Hi, I'm Alicia Anstead, and I'm the editor of Inside Arts Magazine, and I also oversee this largely student 
driven blog for the Office for the Arts at Harvard, and I teach arts journalism also at Harvard. Um, and I'd like to respond to a number of things that you've said. First of all, we haven't really talked about the crisis that we're in, and I think that those of us who come out of traditional journalism have been going crazy trying to figure out how to make a living for the last five or so years. So um, the other thing I want to say is, Doug, thank you and congratulations for the work that you do on Arts Journal. It's, it's been um, a model for a lot of us and also a home base for a lot of us, and for the summit too. And I was one of the ones who tweeted that you look like Al Franken. <laughs> and I would like to say evaluatively, you're better looking. So <laughs> I apologize that that seemed to shake you up a little bit. <laughs> um, but um, in, in response to what you were saying and what you were saying about artists and where are they in this conversation, I think that this is a real opportunity for those of us who have the skills to talk with artists who are used to being the arbit arbiters and the mediators, that, that this is a place where our voice is still valuable. And it may have to be at conferences, it may have to be in forums that are outside of what we're comfortable with, but I think that there is a place for the traditional arts journalist to take his or her skills and apply them in a new way out in the world. This blog that I'm running is one of those ways. We're not trying to do arts criticism, we're trying to build an arts community. And um, inevitably, there's some critical thought that goes into the work that we do. So I, I wanted to say that. Not crit to talk more about your site. I mean, if it's not criticism, what is it? How, how, what, what, how are you building the community? So what we, I have five student bloggers, all of who, whom have some background just in their own lives. One is a musician. One um, uh, has a, a, seems to have incredible experience out in the world of the arts. One is a writer. Um, and uh, one belongs to the Harvard music world. And they simply go out into their worlds, and they come back to me. And this is, this is why my role is, this is the only role that I can play for them, is to say, let's do this. Let, how can I support you in doing this? How can I give you the technology? They go out into the community of Harvard and beyond, and they find the stories. They come back, and they have, th there are rules. They're, they're not allowed to write over 200 words, and they're encouraged to use every type of technology they can come up with. And it's, it's very new, but we're developing it, and we're, we're always looking. So when they go out, it, it might be just a report on some new project, some new art project. It might that's just going be on, a or, quote or from a, description of a an, panel like a, this. A, and, well, I, I'd be delighted to put it on the screen. I don't know. Are it's, you are, are you live? I don't know if I don't know if you see if you see, see if you're on. So and, and the other you know the other thing is I jump What's in Office URL? for the Arts. You have to go to the Office for the Arts at Harvard. That's the entry point. What's the URL? I don't know, Doug. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't. We won't search for it. Now. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to search for it um, because it's it's Jason, it's a funny it's a it. funny. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, I jump in from time to time too. Like for instance, um, on Saturday night, Frank Rich is interviewing Stephen Sondheim um, at Sanders Theater, and Frank Rich is a Harvard grad, so that's our angle. And Frank Rich was kind enough to agree to do an interview either with a student or with me, and it turns out I I happen to do that one. But I jump in too, and occasionally add a professional voice. Sometimes that leans a little bit more toward criticism. Sometimes it doesn't. You know, I got to tell you, I got bored writing reviews. I wrote for 20 years for the Bangor Daily News in Maine. And Maine, contrary to its very bad behavior recently, um, it's a great arts state. And I got to see world-class acts there and write about them. And it was very exciting. But you know what? I, I'm kind of interested in a different thing now. I'm interested in this chaotic world that, that we're in. And one of, the, one, of, one of my hats that I wear is a very traditional, as Doug knows, a very traditional magazine about the arts. It covers the arts industry. And we're also seeing many um, arts people, uh, arts administrators hiring, not many, I wish it were many, that was an overstatement and dream thinking, um, really looking to arts journalists to see if there are ways where they can join the organization and be, become part of building community around the arts. And I think that may be the model. So let me just ask a couple, just my questions, actually. I'm sorry to take up so much time. But Doug, I want to ask you what excites you about what's going on right now. And um, Bill, I want to ask you, 
do you pay your writers and how do you pick your writers? How does your, how does your site pay for itself? And are you interested in more diversity than we're seeing on this panel tonight? Thank you. Do you want to start? Uh, uh, let's, <laughs> well, I don't, most of the writers that are writing for Arts Fees are not getting paid at the moment. In other words, one reason that I've incorporated to become a nonprofit is because I've been feeling that I do want to pay my writers. Uh, and so the attempt is to try to find some sort of model where you know, I'm not going to become a millionaire overnight or in a week, but to be able to pay writers something for what they do. Because I was a freelancer for a number of newspapers in the area for you know, over 20 years. And I would ordinarily, I would be paid for what I'd, I've done. So I ultimately, although people were doing things for free, I, and they were doing good things for free because of high quality writing, I felt that I wanted to pay them for it. So that's part of what the whole process of becoming a nonprofit and exploring that idea in terms of, in terms of payment. Um, so, uh, and just, you just mentioned something about becoming tired as a critic. So let me just say that uh, in, in the history of criticism, generally, you know, particularly really, most of the really good critics were not critics for a long period of time. They did not just have a career where they were, you know, they did it for 20, 30, whatever number of decades. Uh, people like Shaw and other, you know, George Bernard Shaw were on, was only a critic for four years. Uh, Kenneth Tynan also was not a critic for a very long period of time. So this could be, and I'm sort of arguing against myself here, you know, this could be a profession where one can flame out you know, after a series of years and you do become sort of tired of it because you do lose the freshness of approach that you have when you first, you first come. So what excites me uh, myself is the question that the, the student asked earlier, and that is I am interested in ways in which one can take the values of the past and somehow bring them into the future, into the chaos that we find today and look for ways in which people can re be reimbursed for writing evaluatively, critically, about the arts. Because what, I mean, one, one other thing in, that you've mentioned that, and we've sort of touched on it, and that is that for a lot of what's going on in, in terms of arts writing, you're saying, well, sometimes some critical thinking creeps in, and sometimes not, and sometimes they come back with a story, and sometimes with a quotation. Well, you know, I mean, that is, that's sort of what was happening in the 80s and the 90s. I mentioned The New Yorker and the melding of feature writing and, and reviewing. And that is those lines become blurred, right? And as they become blurred, then the idea of what is evaluative writing you know, becomes, becomes to somewhat fade or weaken because an interview, a story, is seen as a form of evaluation. You know, I've done a review. Uh, and I think that, that you, know, you, you do have to, sort, as you bring the past into the present, you do have to keep in mind that you do want to try to keep that dis discriminate between those those forms of looking and writing about the arts, or at least make people aware of the fact that they're fusing them together and that, and that they do have separate lives and, and separate histories. Uh, so just a couple of numbers. Um, in the last three years, 50% of all staff arts jobs have disappeared, and they're not going they're not to In newspapers. In newspapers, yeah. 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 But actually, you can probably apply it, I mean, because most uh, arts journalism jobs were in, in newspapers for a long time. Um, and, um, and, but that, that's not something that's really new. It's just an acceleration, frankly. Um, when the National Arts Journalism Program began back in 1994, uh, about 90% of everybody who applied uh, were staff writers. And that was the, the norm. In fact, they didn't even think about taking um, uh, freelancers back then. This is um, uh, the, the Pew program uh, in uh, arts journalism. Uh, by the time the program closed in 2005, uh, it had completely flipped around. 90% were freelancers. Uh, and it, it's a trend that has, has, has gone for a long time. Um, and you know, if you look if you look out there in other American cities, not you know, not the really major ones, but sort of the second tier, like Minneapolis and like Seattle, and you know, um, you know, those newspaper jobs were pretty well, I mean, pretty good gigs to get. And so what you saw was people would roost in them <laughs> <laughs> for decades. Um, long after they really they, had anything had really hatched. significant to, <laughs> to clock about. So yes. um, <laughs> if you want to continue that way. Yeah. Um, 
in, the, in the not so old days, it used to be that the <laughs> newspaper, the, the, the book reviewer or the, or, the, or the movie reviewer on a newspaper was a guy who was too old to cover the police beat right. anymore, so they, gave, so they gave him the arts yeah. beat. I mean, that happened when I was a young reporter on the Newark News 45 yeah. years ago. So what excites me? Uh, I actually find this an incredibly exciting time. I, I think that periods where everything is static and you know you, you, you know if you do this thing and then that gets you to that thing and you know is there's like these tubes that lead to success and you just sort of you know inch your way up the tubes. That's really I mean it's it's a lot easier in a way, uh, but it's not very interesting. And I think we're in just this amazing period. And I, I think we're coming upon the golden age of, of arts journalism, if 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 you will. Um, Partly because I, I, I do think that um, a lot of the ways in which we have discussed culture in this country, in this country has been really stunted. Um, you know, public discourse on culture in this country, we haven't had much of that for, for 30, 40 years. You know, it's, it's, it's when you can say, oh, we have critics in newspapers, but you know, those are lone voices, and sometimes they're not very good voices. And you know, watch every time there was any sort of culture story that was at least controversial, it would get polarized really fast. And we, we don't know how to talk about culture in very interesting ways. So I find it really, really interesting that people are uh, diving in and wanting to talk about culture now. Um, it also means that our, our definition of and um, the things that we're paying attention to in culture are diversifying in pretty amazing ways. I mean, you know, somebody, I guess it was you, mentioned, you know, there's like three old white guys up here, right? Um, this is not what culture is right now. Uh, you know, the... the, the, the old? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll put myself in that. Um, but the... But, but the thing is, is that, that, you know, definition of what is good, you know, after postmodernism, that's a really difficult thing to, to, to kind of wrap your arms around. The definition of, of, of standards, it's a really difficult thing to wrap your arms around these days. Um, so suddenly to have all of this kind of activity bubbling up um, and this morass of information that we're just swamped by, which everybody is intimidated by, which everybody is, is trying to struggling, trying to figure out how to cope with it. Um, you know, it's the age of the curator. We all have to find people whom we grow to trust, uh, who have authoritative voices, and can put things into some sort of frameworks in which we understand. And hopefully, you know, in a better cultural kind of lens, then we're used to talking about culture in this way. Because I don't think we've done this very well. And I think that, that what's coming is just a lot more interesting. Do you think it will also be far more democratic and interactive than previous models? Oh, unquestionably. Yeah. We know that for sure, in fact. I think you can easily predict. A lot, of, a lot of other things are very unpredictable. I would predict the interactivity will be a crucial part of where arts journalism is going to go in the future. Definitely. Every, every few weeks, there's something that happens that I go, "Oh God, that changes everything," you know. Like right now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, my my whole world is shaken uh, from what Twitter did last week. Right? What Twitter did last week was that it allowed all of its users to make lists and that you can follow yeah. lists. Right? Now, imagine this if you're a news organization. You know, what if you were able to, and, and they now geocode everything, right? So what if you were to define your geographical region and you were able to capture all of the Twitter accounts, right? And you could monitor in, in real time. And you could assign by lists what various people are tweeting about. You could monitor in real time. You'd see a bloom of tweets happening when something would happen. And you could delve into these things. Instead of having a team of 30 reporters or 200 reporters, you've now got a team of 100,000 reporters who can do something. OK, so I'm thinking, OK, as, as somebody who aggregates stories for a living, who goes out and looks at all of these things, you know, God, I'm pretty boring compared to most people, you know, to a lot of people out there, the aggregate number of people out there. So I have to really completely rethink what it means to be an aggregator, or what it means to be a reporter, or what it means, in fact, to cover an area in some way. And, and just this idea of having lists where you could, you know, add up everybody who's interesting on a topic and 
add in and add out and have people follow that, I think is a complete game changer for how we cover news. Because you can do it in multimedia now. How would you do it in the arts? Oh, I'm already, I'm already working on that, which is you know, find all the people who are talking about music in a really interesting way. Make it porous enough so that you can put people on and off uh, the list in, 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 in an easy fashion. And, and then start running the feeds in various levels of curation. Do it for and blogs. And do you it could for make it event specific too, couldn't you? you? Could in other words, who's going to see this movie tonight? Absolutely, right? absolutely. I mean, it, this this makes everybody out there a reporter. Doesn't make everybody an equal reporter, and that's ultimately, in a sense, where I think you need journalists, which who are are making news judgments for what's important and what's not important. But that will be based more from being the center of a community rather than being at the top of a pyramid. Thank the panelists and thank the audience.